Thanks everyone again for joining us this evening. Uh, we're incredibly lucky to have Dr. Casey Albin uh, with us this evening. Dr. Albin is an assistant professor at Emory University School of Medicine, where she's a member of the Department of Neurocritical Care. She completed both her neurology residency and fellowship in medical simulation at MassGen Neurology before completing a fellowship in neurocritical care at Emory. Dr. Albin's research interests focus on educational innovations in acute neurologic emergencies and neurocritical care. She is the editor of the Acute Neurology Survival Guide, as well as associate editor for Continuum, which is one of my favorite neurology publications, and is passionate about open access neuro neurologic education through Twitter, MCRIT, and podcasts. Importantly, and certainly beyond these impressive educational accolades, Dr. Albin is a fantastic speaker and overall human, uh, so it was really a no-brainer for us to bring her here to share her take on neurologic assessment of critically ill patients and kind of the, the future of neurocritical care. So thank you, Dr. Albin, and hand it over to you. And yeah, just thanks again for coming. Really appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Ross, I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. This is a really fun topic for me because I think one of the things that I love most about being an intensivist is thinking about the things that we do every day for potentially no reason and sort of investigating, you know, is this really based in things or is it one of those things that we've just done because we've always done it and there's just, you know, it's hard in, in any sort of healthcare situation to sort of change what has become the institutional standard of care. And so this has been something that I've been very interested in and have done some work to try to like move along within our own, um, you know, system. And so when Ross and I were sort of brainstorming what topics really make an impact across the critical care spectrum for, you know, intensivists across all the disciplines of critical care, you know, I think we're all checking people frequently and doing these neuro checks. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the evidence and what they are and, and why they're good, but maybe why they're not so good. And so part of this um, is a little bit about that background delirium and then um, some of the, the later research in uh, neurology at large. And then we'll start to think a little bit about what does this look like in the future of neurocritical care? And if I could sort of build out a model of where I think we could go, like what that would look like. <clears throat> All right, so uh, moving along. So I have no conflicts relevant to this thought, talk. All right, so everyone has their own specific sort of like brand of neuro checks. Um, basically, these are routine neurologic exams that are performed at the bedside, usually by the bedside nurse. Um, you know, most include some sort of uh, mental status. Some include a re uh, rudimental cranial nerve check. Almost everyone includes some pupils. Various people look at the facial symmetry, you know, like check a gag, but like mostly the pupils. And then plus or minus motor function. And the way in our system this gets coded is that they basically put in a pupillary assessment and then they calculate the GCS, which again, you know, is enough to tell you if there's some major problem or there's some big difference. But this is not like a dedicated detailed neurology exam. And so I, I want to frame this. I think all talks are better if we have sort of a framework to think about this. And I really like the sort of behavioral economic um, paradigm of an opportunity cost. And so we do this for the reason of not missing a neurologic deterioration, right? The whole reason people are in the neuro ICU is because they have an unstable, you know, problem that might, you know, uh, cause them to be acutely unstable and have secondary brain injury. And we deeply, deeply want to prevent that. But I think we have to think about the opportunity cost of doing these frequent neuro checks. And that is what the patient would be doing if they were not being examined and some, you know, that side nurse was not coming in to kind of rattle them and move them around and shine a bright light in their eye and kind of ask them, hey, do you know where you are? And can you, you know, answer these questions? And, you know, like, that's sort of, it doesn't take that long, but at night they would be sleeping. And so I want to think about this in the term and like the opportunity cost here being that we are disrupting people's sleep. And so a little bit of this is about how fundamentally important sleep is. All right. So the, our dilemma and what we're going to explore is how do we balance the cost of missing an acute neurologic decline, which is very bad, with the cost of sleep deprivation? All right. So what's typically happening? So again, there's not a lot of data out there about like how frequently neuro checks are being done or what's included and who does them and who orders from us. But this was a, um, 
a, a nice uh, overview that was done, published in the Journal of Intensive Critical Care Medicine by um, Liprosetta et al. And sort of their, their group has really been looking into this for quite some time over the years. But basically, most of it kind of goes away after the first 48 hours. But where you get assigned to sort of determines how likely you are to have these persist for a long time. With us as neurointensivists, um, my group being like the most likely to continue these uh, Q1 hour neuro checks for the longest amount of time, right? And some of that is sort of a no brainer, like neurointensivists are taking care of sick patients that might decline. But I would argue so are our trauma colleagues and so are our uh, neurosurgeons. And so while maybe non neuro ICU patients, it makes sense that those are de escalated more quickly. Um, those with acute brain injuries, it should make sense, but there also should be a little bit more standardization because it shouldn't really matter if it's a trauma doctor, a neurointensivist, or a neurosurgeon who you get, you know, paired to. Like, if you have a traumatic brain injury, we should have some evidence of like how long should you have these neuro exams. And by the way, what's typically happening, you know, they did a follow-up survey, and even when Q and hour neuro checks are ordered, the bedside nurses that they surveyed uh, said that maybe like seventy percent of those are being done. And I hear this all the time from my colleagues when I work, and I'm like, oh gosh, like I meant to space them out to Q two hour neuro exams yesterday, and then the, the APP will sort of look at me and be like, I'm pretty sure they were they were functionally spaced, you know. And again. What is happening may not reflect what's ordered, but the, the best way we have to direct what is happening is through orders. And so it is appropriate that we have the right orders in place. How long should they continue though? And I think that this is sort of the question of when is the upfront cost most likely to happen and when is it highest? So when is this cost justified? And I think that it's pretty unsurprising, but that depends on the neurologic injury, right? And so really we're asking, when are we most likely to miss an acute neurologic change? All right, so post-thrombectomy, I'll give you some, uh, some literature here, that when we're looking at post-thrombectomy, the things that we most worry about um, are either early cerebral edema, which is rare and more common in the new sort of large core thrombectomy group, or we're looking for, um, you know, hemorrhagic transformation of the stroke, right? That's one of the reasons that all these post thrombectomy patients come to neuro ICUs. Um, these are low. This is a low frequency event in most um, in most registries and in most studies. That's around three percent. It gets up to ten percent in these large core, but um, most of the time three percent. And almost all of that, as you can see here, and this is the group that had hemorrhage, the hemorrhage through survival, you know, you're dramatically through the, the vast majority of your patient population by that 12 hours. So, you know, post thrombectomy, these, these patients do pretty well and they're pretty stable. And at, you know, 12 hours, they probably can be de-escalated safely. But that's different than a patient who has malignant cerebral edema. These are patients who've had gigantic strokes. Um, the swelling is what's going to kill them. And this was a sort of a landmark uh, registry done um, back in the 1990s that looked at all these patients who had malignant cerebral edema. They were young. This was like sort of an average cohort in the 50s. And 80, almost 80% 80 of them died despite maximal medical treatment. And when did they die? They died usually. They had their herniation and death events at day three and day four. But there's a, a you know, there's a tale here. There are some that are surviving, 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 and then fell off a cliff at day six and day seven, right? So again, sort of the expectation is really important that these patients are most fragile and they need acute neurologic monitoring around day two, day three, day four, but we're really not quite out of the woods, even out of week. Traumatic brain injury, I think is one of the, you know, is a, some of the most uh, fascinating neurologic pathology, right? This is a very interesting uh, patient population. Um, they are interesting because some of the acute events happen early on, right? So their course is extremely heterogeneous. And acute complications are most likely in the first 12, even up to 48 hours. This is a nice little um, fatter plot 
looking at the time course of hematoma expansion, right? So that's what we, we, we care about. Like that's going to hurt patients, right? Their subdural expands, their interparenchymal hemorrhage expands, their multi-compartment TBI blossoms, right? That, that is a very fragile time for them. And you can see here that like some patients, you know, their, their hematoma stays the same, like the whole time. And then you can see here, you know, some of these are expansions and almost all of them are happening in the first 12 hours, but some are happening at 24 hours and some are happening further out. But like, again, it seems like this patient population for hematoma expansion is 12 hours. However, then, you know, for anyone who's cared for TBI patients, then they develop seizures. And by the way, they can have vasospasm. And depending on how large their TBI is, they too have cytotoxic edema. And that cytotoxic edema tends to swell at two, three, two, three, four, up to a week. So these patients too, like even if they make it through their first 12 hours of the most fragile time, they're really not out of the woods and they have very long and complicated courses, right? We get to our real problem child with subarachnoid hemorrhage. As a neurointensivist, these are like the best patients to take care of. They are physiologically super interesting. And um, ultimately, a lot of them can do really well. But um, what we're really trying to monitor for after the first you know, 24 hours is delayed cerebral edema. Or, I'm sorry, delayed cerebral ischemia. And like the name implies, this is delayed. This can happen up to 21 days after their initial ictus event of hemorrhage. Um, most of it, as you can see here, is sort of in that like day five, day six. We always tell, like when families come in, we, we try to tell them, you know, the first 10 days, we're going to, we're going to learn a lot about how the rest of your hospitalization looks. If by day 10, you have not developed any vasospasm, your risk of developing delayed cerebral ischemia is exceedingly low. And we're going to really back off. If you start to develop, um, Evident, and remember, vasospasm is not quite the same as delayed cerebral edema, I mean, ischemia. These are used like interchangeably, but I think of vasospasm as more a biomarker of someone who is likely to go on to develop delayed ischemia. Um, but if vasospasm starts early in that first four to five day window, we know that these patients are going to remain at risk of neurologic changes for quite some time. And so when I think about the people who we are really having a problem child situation in terms of sleep deprivation, it is the subarachnoid hemorrhage patient population who we pester, we torture truly with these uh, Q one hour, Q two hour neuro checks for three weeks. And that is brutal for them. Um, and we're doing that because right now we don't really have a better solution. And that I think is, is where the future of neurocritical care has a lot to offer. But again, this is, this is a major problem. We are waking these patients up frequently for a sustained duration of time. So there are obviously other problems that enter the neurocritical care world that enter the, the medical and sickie world. But just to sort of use those as examples that the acute neurologic deterioration varies tremendously based on the pathio pathophysiology. And so to say like, well, we should always stop uh, Q1 hour neuro checks at 12 hours, that just doesn't make sense across the board. Although that is a sort of a wise thing to do probably for our stroke patient population. All right, so the opportunity cost is the sleep deprivation. And I think that it's kind of a no brainer that we sort of know in our consciousness that sleep is good for brain health. Because we know and we've seen that deprivation results in this increased medication requirement, impaired immunity, delirium, leading to overtesting, failure to wean from the ventilator. And this is an incredible review that was published in the Frontiers of uh, Neurology two years, three years ago now. Um, I love this image because I think that this is what, what we are, what we're sort of globally examining is that doing all of this testing is actually impairing patients' ability to recover from their brain injury and probably has sustained long-term impacts. And it's not just delirium, it's also their failure to wean from ventilation. It's also making them have impaired immunity and so they get more infections. It's that they tolerate uh, pain poorly and they're having non-restorative sleep. And we probably end up testing. I mean, if I asked you to show me a show of hands of how many people have unwarrantedly scanned a patient because you know someone came in at six in the morning and couldn't get them to wake up and so 
you know, they went to the head CT or they, they ended up getting some sort of investigation about like, why are they not waking up? And, you know, like after all those interventions were done, you know, 10 AM rolls around and the patient's wake and everything's fine. And, and you realize the patient was just sleepy, right? We've all done that. And so I, I want to emphasize that actually we are learning so much more about the science of sleep and that this is not just sort of a like, oh, like sleepy makes you feel better. It's that actually really incredible restorative functions are happening to the brain when we sleep. And I think it's intuitive that this is really important because sleep is an extremely vulnerable state. And the fact that all animals, and you know, I don't know about the koala, um, so you know, I don't know if the koala is sleeping, but most animals uh, have this like state in which they are resting and they are highly vulnerable to being eaten and attacked and killed. Like the fact that all, all species are highly conserved in this need for sleep probably does say something important is happening. We know that it plays a, a role in neural regeneration, repair the plasticity, our like brain's ability to heal after, after a sustained injury. We know that it's important memory, but I want to talk a little bit um, here about the glymphatic system, because I think that this is sort of an up and coming term that is really exciting and was like um, in the last two years has sort of entered the neurocritical care literature and consciousness. Um, so much so that it was the, the topic of a plenary at the AAN meeting uh, two weeks ago. And I'm going to share with you a little bit of the illustrations from this incredible talk. So what is the glymphatic system? Uh, it is not the most glamorous uh, lymphatic system, although I really like that. It probably is, even though that's not what it stands for. So it stands for the glial lymphatic system. So this is happening in the glial cells of the brain. Um, and it is just like the lymphatic system in our body, where it is this sort of cleaning um, cleansing system in which toxins are removed from the brain and flushed out. And so it's this really highly orchestrated convective movement of CSF that sweeps through the brain, picking up all the toxins um, based on the arterial pulsations. It's creating this movement where all the waste is then um, eventually gets to the jugular system to be returned to the body and to the lymphatic system of the body. So it's, I mean, it's really beautiful. And an important thing that I think is relevant to intensivists, regardless of your specialty, is it's probably impeded by norepinephrine as well as sort of the uh, consciousness in general. But this is shut down when we are flooded with um, adrenergic stimulation. All right. So I want to show you this beautiful picture and um, this, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say her name because I'm going to say it wrong, but she did this beautiful talk from the University of Rochester. This was the plenary session. And I want, what I'm going to show you here is what this looks like. So as we go in, hopefully it was playing earlier. Why is it not playing now? Let's see. How can I make it play? We even like troubleshooted this. Let's try again. Hmm. All right. It's like playing in slow motion. Okay, I'm gonna just describe it to you as we look. But basically envision the CSF is coming in through these small little, um, basically these aquaporin lined channels. So basically you can see the glial cells here sort of form this blood brain barrier, right? We know about the blood brain barrier. The blood brain barrier also leaves a little bit of space around the arteries and CSF is actually coating those arteries in between the blood brain barrier and the artery itself. Um, and so every time the artery pulse, uh, the CSF that's surrounding it gets the signal of of that movement, that like that force that you get with uh, arterial pulsations. And what's unique about this blood brain barrier is that it's enriched in these little channels, which are shown here as these little two sort of like equal signs uh, that are the aquaforin four channels. And it was actually a mystery for a long time why there were so many of these that lined the blood brain barrier. But what we can see now is that CSF, every time there is sort of pulsation of the artery, floods in through these peri artery um, channels, surrounds um, the artery, and then uh, seeps out through these aquaporin-4 channels 
and is all along, like falls through the brain system and then gets all the waste products that are found here into the vein. And so I'm going to try to play it again, see if it'll play now. Oh, there we go. Okay. So what you can see in slow motion is that there, here are all of our waste products. And every time there is a pulsation, there is this conductive sweep of CSF through the brain. And that that is picking up all these little toxins and depositing them in the vein so that they can be recycled into the body. And what we can see, I hope, I hope this one will play. Nice, it is. Okay, so I don't know why the other one didn't play. Ooh, or maybe it's not playing. So what we can see, and again, I don't know why it's pausing the way that it is, is that in the awake state, when they do this experiment, they you know um, label the CSF with a tracer, and this is an in vivo experiment, um, that they're looking at these little mice brains, um, you can see that there is this, the tracer is all through the, um, the cortex, and that you can see the signal, they put the, the tracer in the CSF, and you can trace the CSF through the brain during the sleep state. But that does not happen at all in the awake state. And so these, this, for whatever reason, I think this is the source of sort of ongoing investigation. There is some neuronal activity that auto-regulates how CSF throws through, flows through the aquaporin four channels. And this lymphatic system is not active during the awake system. It is only active during sleep. Nope, still not wanting to play. All right. You can see this uh, at a, micro, a macroscopic level, basically, when they put a little microscope right over the mouse brain. So here's looking down on the mouse brain um, that you can see. We'll try this one more time. And if it doesn't play, it doesn't play. Um, but basically, in sleep or anesthesia, you can see that the CSF tracer is flowing through the brain um, and being recycled. And that same thing is not happening in the uh, awake brain of the mouse. So basically when we play this in the, um, the mouse's awake brain, you just see like this little tiny signal of teal. So again, I'm sorry, the videos are not playing, but basically you get the idea that there is this beautifully orchestrated system that is relying on arterial pulsations to send CSF through these aquaporin four channels that sweeps through and then as it's sweeping through this with this convective current, it drags all the solutes with it so that it goes back into the aquaporin channels of the jugular vein and gets recycled into the, the body. And this is probably what is like so powerfully important about sleep and why sleep underpins so much restorative brain function. And so we're clearing beta amyloid and tau and alpha synuclein. And if you are like, very far from your neurology clerkship where you learned all of this. Remember that beta amyloid is associated with Alzheimer's and cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Tau is also associated with Alzheimer's, but more with supranuclear palsy and cortical basilar degeneration. And then alpha synucleins are sort of our Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's, multiple system atrophy, right? These are like these little misfolded proteins that clog up the brain and end up having a neurodegenerative disease. Really, really important. So again, Sleep is not just for the weak, it is for people that want to restore their brain function and maintain brain health. And what do we do for our poor brain injured patients who are in the neuro ICU or in the ICU in general? We wake them up and we disturb this process, which I think is very unfair of us, right? So it's not just that, but that you have a biological physiologic need to sleep that becomes because of circadian rhythms, but also from what's called the sleep pressure. And that is, as you are working and doing all this stuff all day, you have ATP, you convert that to ADP and ADP is a very strong like currency to tell your brain like it is time to sleep. It's the sleep pressure. So you build up ADP all day and then you go to sleep. And one of the things that's really interesting is that caffeine blocks that signaling. So caffeine is actually not a stimulant. It is an ADP blocker that sort of tricks your brain into thinking that it's actually not time to sleep, that you have like, you are missignaling in this ADT, ADP sleep pressure. So it's just mostly keeping you awake, which I think is really interesting. All right. So when you have so much buildup of ADP, you actually end up in recovery sleep. 
and that's REM and deep sleep. And those patients who actually attain deep sleep are unsurprisingly harder to wake up. So this is that patient that you come in and your sternal rubbing and you're like, they're not waking up and they look terrible. And oh my gosh, like I can't do my neuro assessment on them. And they're probably in delayed cerebral ischemia. And now I have to send them to CTA and CT perfusion. And like, we're sending them to all these tests when really it's just like their ADP process caught up with them and we all have to sleep. So it is not surprising that patients who are sleep deprived have worse cognitive performance and judgment. There's a lot of neural signaling that happens between the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the locus ceruleus, which is part of this sort of sleep pathway that gets impaired. And then it's seizure inducing, right? Like, so I don't know how many of you have had the privilege to work in an epilepsy monitoring unit ever, but like basically we just sleep deprive the patient. So like they have epilepsy and we tell them they can't go to sleep and then they have a seizure. And that is because they are building up glutamatergic neurons and their GABA mystigaline makes them more susceptible to seizures. And here we are doing the same thing to these very fragile patients who often have subarachnoid hemorrhage, who have multi-compartment brain injuries from their TBI, and we're doing something that exposes them to a, a huge risk factor. So seize the day, but like not in a good way. And then there is this whole issue of delirium. And is delirium just a dysfunctioning of the lymphatic system? Is uh, delirium, other cellular signal misfiring. I think delirium is sort of interesting. Not one of those things that I'm like deeply motivated to go and study uh, at a like sort of cellular level, but how much harm we're doing to patients by causing them to be delirious is really something interesting because hopefully we can do simple quality improvements that just help not have this happen. So um, this was something that was fascinating because it ended up in the, uh, the TBI literature, which means that the neurosurgeons are starting to feel more in, uh, or starting to recognize like how neurochecks can impact like the long-term prognosis of patients. So this is an interesting study. This was just published. We, we talked about this quite a lot in Journal Club, but basically showing that the time to delirium was much shorter in those patients who were getting Q1 hour neurochecks. So how, how much you were evaluated, like rapidly sped up, like had a, like, if you could just space out the neurochecks, you reduce delirium by over 50%. Now, I will say this study is a little bit confounded because the only place that people can get Q1 hour neurochecks is in an ICU. And there's probably something else going on in an ICU with all the beeping and buzzing and just the high activity that happens in our critical care units that also is probably deliriogenic, not just the neuro checks. But I do think it's important to recognize that like, this is something that we can, that we can sort of address and be mindful of, right? Delirium is also really hard to study in the neuroscience patient population. The most widely used and have, I guess, I, I'm not going to say validated because they're, they're not necessarily validated in the neuroscience population, but there is some validity evidence is the CAM or sort of the confusion assessment method and the ICU version, which, you know, this is important because if you've ever performed a CAM, you know that it's like asking patients like silly questions, like does a rock float on water and things like that. Well, if you're aphasic, you can't participate with that kind of assessment, right? And not all aphasic patients are delirious, but they're going to screen positive if they have any other sort of fluctuations. Remember, CAM, you get a positive score if you're three out of four positive on the various um, metrics. Um, so again, I think sometimes our neuroscience population is sort of at a disadvantage based on their brain injury. Um, neurologic deterioration also just can't be attributed to delirium without sort of a comprehensive workout that is not their edema, their vasospasm, their rebleeding, their seizures, their ischemia, their cortical spreading to polarization, their herniation, their hydrocephalus. Like the patients who have brain injuries are at higher risk for having bad things happen as a result of those brain injuries. And so you have to de facto do more workup to exclude confounders. Um, and also, you know, patients have to be awake to participate with these screening assessments. Some of our patients are in a coma and you can't screen the, uh, the comatose patient. There is some um, ongoing sort of looking at sort of the validity um, for using CAM or the uh, intensive care uh, delirium screening checklist 
against the diagnosis or the DSM-5. Uh, There's some validity evidence around DSM-4, particularly for stroke patients. Um, but again, you know, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that when we're studying these patients, there is some inherent limitations about the tools that we are using to study them. Still, they screen positive a high amount of time. And in a study of TBI patients, you know, there was still pretty good interrelated reliability for the um, intensive care delirium screening checklist for um, neurologists, intensivists, trauma surgeons, nurses. Um, there's fairly good concordance. So again, like these aren't wonderful kappa values, but they're not the worst either. So again, um, I think that there is hope that we can use these tools. I think they're still reasonable. We still uh, have our nurses uh, do the best they can, but whenever you're studying it in sort of a population-based way, you have to keep in mind that, you know, this is not the most, this is not as reliable in neurologic patients as it is in other patients without acute brain injuries. All right. All of those sort of like, by the way, I'm going to tell you that this is totally not valid, but I'm going to tell you some results anyways. In a meta review, the most important and the most rigorously conducted uh, re um, studies that they had reviewed in this meta-analysis showed that the identification of delirium in neurocritical care patients independently predicted poor clinical outcomes and longer length of stay and worse functional recovery and cognition. Again, I think you know that. But it's not just like they spend more time in the hospital. It's that a year out, they're performing a lot worse. So this is the days of delirium that the patient experienced. And then their adjusted repeat battery of the assessment of neuropsychological status a year out. And still, the longer you have delirium, the more you perform like a patient who has Alzheimer's. And that to me is like very problematic, right? These were patients who were neurologically normal. They were admitted. Um, for, you know, their long-term cognitive impairment after their career. This, I'm sorry, let me say, this is in a medical sick patient population, not in a neuro ICU. So again, this is just how much delirium takes a toll. And I think, again, this is saying that people who are at risk for delirium have some underlying fragilities that probably have been exposed by their delirium. And then that cognitive unmasking translate a year out. But I think this is important, right? These are patients who were doing fine and now are performing like dementia patients. All right. And, you know, we know this. Like when you ask if providers feel that hourly neurochecks are necessary, most providers in this study said, you know, I think they're probably pretty detrimental to patients. The ordering providers more significantly thought this than just the people who are carrying out doing the assessments. Similarly, the ordering providers believed they would not utilize neuro, hourly neurocheck if there was another available monitor available. So duh, like we feel like we're hurting patients. We probably are hurting patients, but the problem is, is that we don't have really better things to do to, to not miss that acute upfront cost of missing a neurologic deterioration. All right, so how can we balance these costs now? Neither of these interventions are particularly sexy, but I think one reason is just being mindful of the fact that when we are performing assessments and we are waking patients up, we are probably doing them a severe disservice and just adding it to your checklist of like, does this patient need to be woken up? Or is there a way that we can, if they are not a neurologic patient, either space out their vital checks or just have their vital checks be non or invasive so that they're continual monitors. Like, what can we do so that people are not having to disrupt them when it's not their spontaneous awakening trial time, right? That sleep should occur at night the best that we can so that we are not fragmenting, you know, the neuro ICU or the medical SICU, CV ICU, no matter what patient population you're caring for, letting them sleep at night is probably a good thing, probably because their glymphatic system is working and clearing all their toxins. And then I think sort of another sort of reasonable thing for us to consider is that we know that propofol, fentanyl, and benzos, specifically the GABAergic drugs like propofol and benzodiazepines are really dysregulating their slow wave sleep and are not helpful for recovery. And so that brings us to sort of Presidex, the new, you know, everyone loves Presidex. Um, and I actually do think, again, this is like, you know, the, the non-sexy stuff, like don't interrupt them. It probably does help. Going to Presidex, though, you know, alpha-2 agonist that works at the level of the locus ceruleus, so it is helping in sort of regulating our drive to sleep. And, you know, in a 
In a non-ICU patient, it may enhance slow wave sleep by mimicking the endogenous uh, non-REM sleep pathways. So again, there's some evidence there that in a physiological sense, we can improve sleep with using precedence. However, this is not really borne out in studies. So again, this is a small study, but in this one where they enrolled about 20 patients and did a polysomnogram on them as they were sleeping, being on Presidex doesn't really seem to get you into the slow wave sleep. It does help you stay in sort of your like light sleep. So they had less fragmented light sleep, but we were still not getting that restorative deep wave sleep. That said, we know that the MENS trial showed that, you know, this is more effective than using an Ativan uh, or a benzodiazepine sort of method of uh, sedation, lower prevalence of uh, days without delirium or coma. In cardiac surgery patients, the use of Presidex on uh, post, post op day one, sorry, that should say post op, not post PON, uh, or actually, the, lie, should say PON because I meant night, post op night one reduced delirium for the first week of hospitalization, said non-cardiac CQ patients post-op night one, uh, dex, uh, increased the quality of sleep reported. So again, didn't really get to that polysomnogram like level of like, we verified that you actually got better sleep, but at least they felt better. Um, and intubated patients on uh, dex had lower rates of delirium. So again, this is not the neuroscience patient population, but for any of you working in non-neuroscience uh, ICUs, which is, <clears throat> sorry, I think is most of our audience, you know, this is, this is not a bad idea. And this is sort of a like low hanging fruit. But what I want to spend like at least the next five, maybe even 10 minutes on is what would the future look like? And how can we actually get to a point where the, the best thing we have is not, you know, kind of sternal rubbing the patient in the middle of the night and asking them to do a GCS and look at their eyes. What else could we do to better monitor them so that we are actually letting them recover at night and then focusing on our spontaneous awakening trials and sort of being alert during the day? And the future is really that sort of multimodal neuromonitoring, where we have a bunch of monitors, both non-invasively and sometimes invasively, um, to track the physiology of what's happening at the brain. And there are so many of these you know, I think we feel like neuromonitoring comes from ICP monitoring, which is, you know, either a bolt or um, having an uh, external ventricular drain. We can do CPP monitoring, brain tissue oxygenation monitoring. One of the ones that I'm going to focus on, because I, I really like it a lot, is the sort of continuous EEG and then using quantitative EEG to show, show these like larger trends in what's happening to the patient's uh, brain waves. Quantitative pupillometry is another nice thing. It's still, you know, you have to shine a light in the patient's eye, but again, minimizing how much we're like bothering them. Um, cerebral blood flow monitoring, either with mirrors or with other methods, cerebral microdialysis, and then transcranial dopplers. And that's just some of them. Like these are the most commonly used ones, but there are others. And this, this is really in my mind, the future of what is going to happen in neurocritical care, hopefully over the course of my career. Um, when we think about this, you know, this should be guided by what we are monitoring for. So this was um, a paper by Brandon Foreman et al. Um, that was just recently published in 2023 in Critical Care Medicine, thinking about what are you looking for? And then sort of what are the, the, the multimodal neuromonitors that you should be using? And remember, the physiology of the brain is directly related to the physiology of the body. And so multimodal neuromonitoring is also multimodal systemic mon uh, monitoring. Um, but this is, I think, a really nice way to conceptualize that there are, there are certain monitors that give us a better uh, window into what is happening. So if we really care about cerebral ischemia, knowing what the per cerebral perfusion pressure is, knowing what the optimized CPP is, knowing what the brain tissue oxygenation, I would argue that cerebral ischemia can also be really nicely visualized on uh, quantitative EEG, which we'll talk about. We're looking at metabolic crisis, probably more cerebral microdialysis, which I'm very sad we don't do anymore at Emory. All right. So where has this best been studied and where is there the best evidence base? Again, there is no sort of consistent consensus statement about this. These are widely um, 
variably available and not every uh, even high quality sort of neuro ICU tertiary care center has access to all of them. But we know it's those problem children that we talked about early in the course, like the TBI patients where they may have seizure, they may have ischemia, they may have vasospasm, they may have worsening cerebral edema. They are also systemically very, very sick. The um, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage patients that the ones that are in high grade, grade four, grade five, we don't have a good exam to monitor for them. And then the ICH patient that, you know, is not, is resuscitated, but like still is in a coma. So again, this is based on expert consensus, not on sort of high randomized control trials. So what is, you know, I think one of the things that I want to show you is that this is already starting. Um, we are using more and more of these multimodal monitors to get sort of a continuous window of what's going on. The problem is that they are not always continuously read, right? And that I think is the future is that we are now having this explosion of AI and the application of AI to sort of using some of the detection to tell the clinicians at a bedside, hey, this patient is problematic now. Like you need to either direct your exam to now, or you just need to go to an escalated monitoring for physiology. So we're going to look at sort of how um, quantitative EEG can do this. So we're using this more and more in delayed cerebral ischemia detection, because as you become, as your brain is deprived of oxygen, it, the normal beta frequencies slow down and down and down. So we move, I'm sorry, alpha frequencies, move from alpha frequencies to this theta frequencies to this delta frequency. And that's because the brain doesn't have enough to support sort of that higher level um, cognitive function. And so you, what you get is, is sort of a drop off in what's called the alpha delta ratio. So this is what's kind of shown here. This is a beautiful infographic made by one of my fellows. Um, looking at sort of the ratio between alpha, these normal waves, and delta, these bad slow waves that are uh, a window into possible ischemia. And so again, shown here, what you can see is that normal brain has a lot of activities, right? This is what a good EEG should look like. A brain that is in ischemic and like deprived of the cerebral blood flow it needs looks like this. And if you have a patient, you know, who, you know, goes into cardiac arrest and then is really deprived of all uh, oxygen is having this anoxic injury where they are completely suppressed on EEG. And we can leverage that, just look for these trends in delayed cerebral ischemia without waking up the patient every three seconds to be like, hey, are you awake? Can you lift your arms? Like, you know, what day of the year is it? Are your pupils okay? And so, you know, again, this is a this is sort of the the future. I think is pairing this with other modes of assessment to better understand, you know, what is happening at the brain physiology. All right. So to do this, to get the spectral analysis or the quantitative analysis of this, it's going to undergo a transformation where basically the waves are broken up into how much of this is how much of this wave is an alpha wave like a good normal fast frequency and how much of the wave is built up from these slow components of this delta wave and so you know mathematically you can break that wave down to say well there's some component of it that is a delta wave because the background is slow but there's also a lot of fast riding alpha wave and that's good so it gives it, it can give you sort of a how much alpha how much delta is there in sort of this nice looking line. And we're gonna talk through this really quickly because I wanna spend some time for questions. Why is it frozen? No, no, let's see if we can get back. Why is it giving me this little like thing? Hold on guys, I may have to just reopen this PowerPoint. I don't know why it froze. I'm going to share a screen again. It's like my computer is just like very slow right now. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk through this. 
is that we can basically use a spectrogram for it to give you sort of a ratio of how much alpha activity, aka good activity is there, versus how much delta activity, aka bad slope. And regard, like to understand this, you have to have a, a background understanding of what the brain looked like before delayed cerebral ischemia may have set in. So you need sort of a, a baseline, but there are many, many ways that we can sort of use this alpha and delta ratio to say like, is this brain staying about the same or is it more at risk for ongoing cerebral changes because there's a higher amount of delta, uh, delta activity, meaning that the ADR sort of drops off to the baseline. Huh, it's still frozen, but it's funny because every time I stop, stop sharing my screen, it unfreezes. So I don't know what's up with that. Hmm. Well, now it's frozen entirely. All right, let's restart. Sorry about this, guys. Questions on that while we're while we're waiting for this PowerPoint to reload. I saw there was a question in the chat. RCT. Oh, randomized clinical trial. Sorry. There's not a random, I think, I can't remember what I was talking about, but there wasn't a randomized control trial looking at various different things. Yeah, thanks, Casey. I, I think it was just uh, referring to the, your interesting uh, figure showing the relationship between um, uh, delirium onset and mm -hmm. the proportion of patients receiving um, the Q1 uh, check. So I was just wondering if it was an RCT or not, because that would oh, be- Oh, no, 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 no. This is great. Um, this was not an RCT. No, this was a retrospective analysis. Okay. So again, extremely confounded data, right? Like the only reason this is exciting is because it got published in ne the Journal of Neurosurgery, which meant that they, like the neurosurgeons are starting to realize like this is an important thing for our patients. But- to me, this like laid the groundwork for us to understand and have a shared mental model that like, even, even if there is a cost of missing things, there's opportunity cost of like the fact that we are doing something bad to patients by, by waking them up. So no, this was retrospective and it was not at all. It was like a horribly confounded study that only goes to show that like, if you wake people up in a sort of retrospective way, it shows that like more time being woken up every one hour is not as good as letting people sleep even for two or four hours. So yeah, great it's, it's very compelling, compelling yeah, story. Thank you. Yeah, totally. All right. We're back up. Let me share my screen again. All right. So we can see again, I don't know what happened, but we're also looking, we can also examine relative alpha variability. We can look at the relative uh, asymmetry of a spectrogram. Again, there are many ways in this sort of quantitative analysis to say the same thing, that one side of the brain is not the same as the other side of the brain. One side of the brain has more delta activity and delta activity is a marker of ischemia. And of course, you know, this can, this is also can be a marker of just other things, but you know, something to be aware of when one side of the brain has this problem and the other side does not. We also know that DCI um, is really well predicted by late onset epileptiform discharges. So when you start to get into the interictal pattern of having, you know, LPDs or which are lateralized periodic discharges or GPDs, um, those <clears throat> are another way that the brain is saying, I am not getting enough oxygen. I am not functioning right. And so I'm going to have these little epileptic bursts that are not evolving into seizures, but are not healthy for the underlying brain tissue either. Um, so I'm going to show you this in a case. This was a patient who came in with a large subarachnoid hemorrhage. They were in a coma. They had no exam to follow. Um, and you can see that there's a clot where the aneurysm ruptures. So the left side of the brain was already a little bit worse off than the left. And what we see is on day one, we see that. So this is those alpha delta ratios. It, again, this is just a linear sort of like a ratio. And the left side is blue. So already at baseline, we can see here that the, the left side, the blue line is below the, the red line. The red line healthier alpha frequencies, the red, the blue line on the left, more delta. And as we go along, let me see if I can put this back into teaching mode. Um, we can see that here more just 
like in a larger blown up model. Again, the left side where there is already a peri like little blood clot, not as healthy as the right side. And we get the first day TCD screening and the patient has normal amounts of, you know, their waveform looks very nice and normal. Their velocities are in the normal range. This all looks well and good, right? And so this is our one, you know, daily monitoring of TCDs for that day. And then overnight, I get a call from our EEG reader saying like, did something happen? Did y'all start sedation or did the patient change? Because what looked like this a couple hours ago, the alpha delta ratios have now just fallen to basically pure delta on both sides. So both the right side and the left side are basically like right at the bottom, meaning it's all delta. And you can see here on this, the raw EEG, this is just like these large dysmorphic sad waves that have no sort of like faster frequencies overlying them. And again, this patient had no exam to follow. They looked terrible. They were in a coma. So it's not like we would have detected this on just bedside monitoring. We would have just waited to the next day to get TCDs to see that like, oh, their velocities were up. But instead, because we were following this in real time, we sent the patient for a scan. And sure enough, not only did they have sort of this hemorrhage in their left, you know, um, frontal temporal lobe, they also had very early on the second day of admission developed really severe vasospasm, particularly in that left MCA territory, but also in the right A1. And you can't really see it here, but take my word for it in the, in the left A1 as well. So again, you know, this was a sort of continuous mode of monitoring that clued us into a neurologic change when we couldn't detect a neurologic chain at the base, at the bedside. And so we say, oh, like the patient's in vasospasm. They had very high ICP, so we weren't able to give them intrathecal nicardipine, which is sort of our usual. We start milrinone, and sure enough, several hours later, that alpha-delta ratio, we start to see that we are getting more alpha variability. And the patient actually has relative alpha variability. All is getting better in the world. Um, we get TCDs a couple hours later, which confirm, in fact, that, you know, are high, but I think they were probably higher before melanin was started. Um, and again, like without continual monitoring, we would have just been waiting, you know, until 11 to get these TCDs back that show, hey, the patient's in vasospasm. So they get better, their alpha delta ratio ends up segregating back out to sort of that baseline normal where the blue is a little bit lower than the red. Um, and I don't think the patient ended up doing like fantastically well, but they lived and they were spared from the secondary injury of delayed cerebral ischemia. So again, you know, a couple of days later, we're seeing this nice sort of like back to the baseline. This certainly is very bad, whereas this is sort of still a lot of Delta activity, but much better. And so what this case and why I like this case is it shows that intermittently in some patients, we can bind non-invasive data to predict who is likely to suffer so that we can escalate therapy appropriately or wake people up when it is like helpful and then we have a positive predictive value that that exam is going to change management. But what we can't do is that even if this is data acquired immediately, right now we still rely on the epilepsy fellow looking at it, right? And so the future is that someone is going, or you know, the AI is continually monitoring this to say, beep, 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 there was a decrease in like the alpha frequencies, the delta th frequencies are way up on the right side of the brain, do you need to do something? And again, I think that is the future. Like I think AI can help us sort of package all this big data and make it clinically meaningful at the bedside. Obviously you have to interpret this in clinical context. Sensitivity and specificity vary by each level of this multimodal monitoring. And then again, it's not universally available. And a lot of this is still investigational and it takes time and resources. Um, and so right now it's not, it just can't be universally applied. Um, and so again, I think we're asking the wrong questions. If we ask, can a monitor change outcomes, right? That's like the swan problem. Like the swan is not going to change outcomes. What you do with data that you get changes outcome and you have to be good at interpreting data. Um, and so again, I think a lot of this is learning how do we interpret this data and what is the signal and what is the noise. Um, but I think this is really where we're going. And I think we have to go there because what we're doing now, which is just waking people up and bothering them, actually is very detrimental for brain health healing. So with that, I think it went a little bit over because of uh, the, the amount of time we had to troubleshoot the computer. But we still have a couple of minutes left and I'm happy to take questions or you know, get people's um, feedback and advice and 
what are y'all are doing and and have a talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Albin. That was that was incredible. And certainly we will, if if you're okay with it, take a few more minutes of your time to ask some questions. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just kick it off. We don't have um, quantitative EEG widely available, but we have sub hairline EEG for all of our comatose patients. Is there a way to calculate alpha delta ratio on sub hairline EEG? And would that be validated? Because I'm thinking that would be something that we could implement if, if possible almost immediately. Like a sedline like monitor? Yeah, exactly. We have the yeah, frontal electrodes. It's very similar to sedline, but it's it's yeah. actually sub hairline, like raw sub hairline EEG. So you have uh, your frontal leads only. Got it. I don't know. I don't know the, the studies around that. And I'm not sure there have been some. I mean, the idea is still the same, like, right? If you have a baseline and you can see that there are frequencies that are normal for brain waves, and you see a decrement on one side versus the other, right? I think that this quantitative EEG is kind of limited because you need a, a step by a side by side comparison. When the whole brain starts to go down, then it can just be a lot of stuff like it doesn't necessarily pinpoint to ischemia in one place and so i think in that way it is sort of nice to have the full montage but but i don't think it's impossible i just it's just one of those things that like i'm not sure that we've explored yet or how we we have not used yet i see a hand raised from karen there he is oh, Hi, yes, um, that was absolutely fantastic. This topic is near and dear to my heart. So I really appreciate um, your, your fantastic slides and your talk. Um, I, I was wondering a couple of things. Are you looking to see if any of your patients that you're doing neuromonitoring on are having sleep as defined by AS, AASM criteria? And are you looking for like REM sleep and non-REM sleep or is it just the alpha delta and so on? And yeah, my second no, question was, no. are you looking at the odds ratio product at all to look at left and right brain connectivity? Yeah, so the, the second question is no. Um, we have enough trouble getting people just to read the ADRs and the relative alpha variability. And so we have stuck to those two things to say like, we want the alpha delta ratio reported and we want you to report the relative alpha variability every day. And even with that, um, because right now we don't have a dedicated ICU EEG program that is really hit or miss. We are hiring someone who is going to be a dedicated EEG ICU encephalographer. It's like who I think is going to help sort of standardize this across like, you know, the fellow in this case was a very um, interested in EEG, in critical care EEG, and was a very uh, proactive fellow, but that is not the case across the board. And then yes, we actually do look, and I, it's one of the things that I ask when we are, when I have any patient hooked up to continuous EEG is how often are you seeing like, you know, architecture of sleep on the EEG and, and, and not necessarily, I'm not studying in any regular way, but just, I will combine that and talk with um, the families about, you know, that being a positive predictive outcome. Danielle Sandsmark, who's um, down at Penn, did some work looking at all the TBI patients and neuro recovery um, after, you know, um, after documenting sleep spindles. And those patients who had preserved sleep architecture actually went on to have much better outcomes. And so it's one of the things that I ask for in the report because I use it to sort of talk to the families like, hey, we've seen this positive prognostic factor. I'm really hopeful that actually their brain might have some recovery. I'm curious how you're using it. Um, we're, we're not looking, so when we're doing, um, sub hairline EEG and then continuous EEG, it's being read for seizure activity, or if we're like post anoxic brain injury for prognostication in terms of reactivity and things like that, uh, but not being read for, for sleep. No. Yeah. A lot of times I'll have to call and sort of ask like, Hey, do you mind like going back and looking specifically for this? And then they will usually like the EEG people will do that. But I think it's only uh, reported if people are like curious about it, which I, I do think that it helps us to say like, that's a really good thing. If your brain is getting sleep, that shows that there is a, a lot of preserved goodness that is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fascinating work. And thanks so much. Yeah. Um, Murat? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Alvin. It's fat, like super interesting talk and he's such a great storyteller. There's so much to sort of take away. I just wanted, uh, can you share for your cyberarachnoid hemorrhage patients, um, 
What is your usual monitoring? Um, I may have missed this, but do you do continuous TCDs or continuous CGs for them and any way to detect late cerebral ischemia? Um, any yeah. advice so, there? So um, where I trained, we did continuous EEG on all grade four and fives uh, and, some, and most of the grade three. And that was phenomenal. And there was a really um, diligent critical care EEG program in place. And then the first year I got to Emory, we still sort of had that. And there was a lot of interest in doing that. And then in the pandemic, really things kind of fell apart. And so we are now just getting back on track for putting like, we have the machines that we would, that we have enough machines that we could probably put most of our high grades of racks. Um, we're a very high volume subarac center. So we actually have kind of a lot of them, especially sort of in the summertime. Um, but we can still put all of the high grades on continuous EEG. The, the issue right now is that there are just not enough people who are dedicatedly reading this alpha delta ratio and the relative uh, er, alpha variability in such a way that it's actionable. And so because it became sort of unactionable um, in the pandemic, I sort of moved away from ordering it on every patient. And like, I'm just kind of, biding my time until it comes back and we like have enough people reading it or have AI read it so that we can actually make decisions based on something. Because right now it gets read so late that it's not actionable, right? Like you have to have someone to have it be useful. It needs to be sort of continually read for the things that it's being read for. Um, so our protocol, so we have a, a TCD robot. We've had some problems like putting it into place um, and it is clunkier than just the TCD tech that we know and love. And so our TCD tech right now will do um, baseline uh, TCDs on everyone seven days a week. If we are really concerned, I can usually kind of like pull teeth enough to get her to come back. So if she did an assessment and I see, you know, again, vasospasm and DCI are not the same thing, but vasospasm is certainly a strong marker of who's going on to develop delayed cerebral ischemia. So if I see someone with very high TCDs velocities and we're starting intrathecal nicardipine or milrinone, I can sometimes drag her back to do another one in the afternoon just to see if that, that vessel is relaxing. At the other site where I work, it's actually much easier to get twice a day TCDs um, because we have more TCD techs there. Um, but in the center where we have the most subarax is actually sort of like you get that one TCD plus minus the EEG. Um, but the, the goal, I think, is to really pair the quantitative EEG spectral analysis with the, the TCDs because you're seeing different things. Like I think the EEG is sort of picking up on the microvascular milieu of the, the cells and how they're firing, whereas the TCDs are just picking up on vasospasm. And the two together sort of combine nicely. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, yeah that, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Dr. Debicki, why don't you, or maybe Dr. Debicki, he's our uh, local neurocritical care. Yeah, for uh, sure. Hi. Service. Yeah. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, doing well, thank you very much for your talk. I, yeah, I'm, I really, uh, really enjoyed it. I, I enjoy following your discussions on social media and um, I lend out your textbook to all of our, to many of our trainees and, and that type oh, of thing as well. So, yeah, so it's, it's great to, to hear you talk. And a very uh, important topic. I often, I'm, I'm always worried about patients that we admit for stroke and for everything else about uh, keeping them awake all night. And definitely have seen the development of delirium and delayed uh, kind of um, recovery in that context. So, you know, very important topic. And and I always, you know, kind of tell the the residents and fellows that I think the the future of neurocritical care, especially in the next five to ten years, is really kind of looking at how can we try to prevent secondary injury in our patients and do a lot better of a job uh, than, than we are currently. And so, um, so really thank you. Um, and just to kind of clarify a couple of the questions also just for the local um, questions, uh, uh, Karen, we do look for sleep spindles all the time. I read continuous EG for our, our unit. Um, and uh, so we do, it's just that most of our patients are such so encephalopathic that we just don't see it. Um, and we, or they're in status and we have limited machines, so we can't really, um, we're not able to really dedicate, um, our machines for those patients that we want to see that recovery. And especially in our subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, I really wish we could 
monitor them the way that you're talking about. We do have persist, so we could potentially do that, um, but it's uh, just an availability issue and whether we can have the resources to do it. Um, we're actually embarking on, a, we're, we're working with um, um, one of our colleagues and we'll be using uh, near infrared spectroscopy to really look for um, markers of cerebral oxygenation non-invasively to to get at the same type of question. But I agree, this, it's really important to be able to look at what the function of the brain is doing, not only just the anatomic vasospasm, doesn't always correlate with delayed cerebral ischemia. So you really wanna pick up those patients where there's a functional deficit that's happening. So um, yeah, and Ross, uh, I can show you how to use uh, the, we do have quantitative measures on our, it's a really limited montage. We have some frontal electrodes, and some temporal electrodes. It's kind of like the cerebellum without the posterior electrodes. Hmm. And it's right on our, on our bedside monitoring system. And so we, we do have some quantitative measures that I can kind of show people how, how to use them if they'd like. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I really appreciate your talk. I think it's an extremely important uh, um, topic and, and you really brought it to light very nicely. So thank you. I appreciate that. It's like one of those things you're just like, oh, like, this is so frustrating that we just like, this is like the best way that we can monitor these patients, but like we're harming them. Like there has to be a better way, <laughs> but yes, it is a resource. I mean, I really, I feel the struggle. Like we have, I think now the machines to do this, but then not the personnel. And you're like, why do we have the machines if we don't have the personnel? Like, like, yeah, this takes a team. It's just, I, I, <laughs> I feel it. Yeah. We're really trying to, we're trying to build up our, our continuous EG program. I think we've made some strides over the last few years, but uh, we've, we've certainly want to hone in on a few patient populations that we can really try to improve things. And, and, and we're bringing in different um, uh, monitors and, and multimodal kind of aspects of things. And we're a center who does a lot of research on neuroprognostication and outcomes, including cognitive outcomes. So again, all of these little interventions that can improve what the outcomes are down the line is going to, is going to be really important and, and, Really important to really parcel out what works and what doesn't. Oh, for sure, for sure. Maybe, maybe just hopping in for the last two questions here, Eric, and then Anton, just uh, recognizing your time, Dr. Alvin. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Alvin. Excellent talk. Um, I've heard you talk a couple of times and it's always really outstanding. I have sort of a broad question. So like I'm a general critical care medicine trainee, like a recovering surgeon. And and I every time and a Canadian and work in a Canadian system, every time I hear about advanced neuro monitoring, it, it all sounds really awesome. But it seems like every time you hear a talk, there's a new modality that we don't have access to in Canada yet that has great applications. Um, do you see this getting rationalized in the next five or ten years from automated, you know, different five different advanced monitoring modalities, all of which you have to have a lot of capital and a lot of time to get good at to the point where, okay, like these are the two or three things we think are really helpful and every, and, and a general, you know, intensivist who does some neurocritical care, but isn't a neurointensivist can get a handle on. Cause it feels very like an, a, a field that's expanding away from and making it harder for access, both totally. for cost and intellectual capital reasons. Absolutely. I mean, I think that right now, I mean, most of these multimodal monitors are happening in large clinical trials, like Boost 3 is how we have our PBO2 monitors, right? None of our patients are getting PBO2 monitors unless they are enrolled in a trial. Um, we used to have cerebral microdialysis, but it's an incredibly expensive. Um, yeah, I love this cap refill, totally. Um, it's incredibly expensive to do cerebral microdialysis, and it just wasn't changing what we we're doing enough to justify the cost. So absolutely. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I focus on EEG, because I think of all of these, EEG has the ability, it is, it is of all the monitors, probably the most widely available. And the, the montages, I think, you know, already with like methods like Cerebell, they're getting better at making these cheaper and easier to put on so that everyone can do this at the base, um, the bedside. So I think in the next 10, 15 years, I will, like the ones that I see really having the most promising promise other than like your like external ventriculostomy drain, which is always going to be nice for your actual number of ICP is an EEG um, because it's cheap. Most places have it for seizure detection. It's like, how can we use it to like 
look better at cerebral perfusion and neuroprognostication because we have this, we just haven't really refined the software and sort of the automation of it to make it as useful as it possibly could be. So that's why I like EEG is because I think that of all of these, this is probably the most widely accessible. And I think it's going to be even more accessible, especially as we get these sort of like bedside monitors um, where there's actually like the industry is really like leaning into those and developing those and has a lot of capital um, versus like cerebral microdialysis, I think is going to stay like well in the research realm for a long time, just because it's not widely available. It takes, you know, having a catheter in the brain, which again requires a surgical placement and like, that's not widely available. So yes, I do think that this, there will be some centers that continue to push the frontiers and sort of figure out which are helpful, which are not helpful. But the sort of ICP monitoring, getting cerebral perfusion optimization, which again is just a like sort of software device that helps sort of automate like where is your brain personally best perfused? Like right now that's still uh, is sort of only regionally available, but I think because it's mostly just sort of an automation of software that will become sort of more widely available. Um, but I, I think that the future has to be that this is widely available. Otherwise it's not really, um, it, it's not helpful if we can't get to a lot of people. So I, I totally get it. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, you're muted, buddy. Yeah. Sorry. First time using zoom. Uh, thanks so much, <laughs> Dr. Alvin. Uh, great talk. Um, my question is more to do with uh, how this has been going at your institution. So I love getting away from sort of dogma of just universal Q1 checks and treating the intensivist rather than the patient. What are you doing at your institution now? How much resistance have you had from other intensivists? And how have you overcome that? So there, so we we're working right now to have it in Epic show a little like reminder, like does this patient need Q1 hour neurochecks? because the default for our ICU is Q1 hour neurochecks. And within our group, there's a lot of like, we all agree, like this is not good for patients. We've had a lot of like meetings in Kumbaya. I will tell you that there is resistance in the subarachnoid hemorrhage patient population. Like those patients, until we have a lot more safety data in terms of our stroke patients, those subarachnoid hemorrhage patient populations are gonna keep getting Q1 hour neurochecks because no one wants to miss them. There's a lot of resistance to de-escalating for that. So like at our institution, like they are going to get Q1 hour neuro checks, even though we are harming them. And I think there's actually probably the most evidence around like DCI detection in multimodal. There's still just fear. Um, the stroke patients, I think there's a lot more willingness to kind of work around. And so now we are just sort of trying to implement, but in sort of, I guess the last like year really, I have been like in my dot phrase of rounding have like, have like a, is the patient on Q1 hour neuro checks? Do they need to be? And when I say that, like, Hey, like why is grandma getting Q1 hour neuro checks like three days into her stroke? Like she's not going to swell. She's not getting malignant cerebral edema. Like she just needs to sleep. And there's a lot more like, yes, we all agree. And I do think some of that is actually starting to sort of permeate into our, our like our neurosurgical colleagues who, you know, are really, really good. And they're very invested in the subarachnoid patients, which is why they don't want to let go of this. But I do think that there is more consciousness of like, we are hurting patients when we do this. So it is, it is a step-by-step. -step. Um, and I think a lot of it is like, sort of just like the unsexy sort of like baseline, just like asking, like as part of your dot phrase, just like DVT prophylaxis, do we have to keep, do we have to keep waking this patient up? Yes, Thanks. intensivism at best. Do less, yeah. for sure. This was really fun, guys. Anytime you want to talk more about like how we can do less, I am your neuro, I am your neurologist. Well, thank you so much for coming and Thanks for sharing that. That was incredible. And I know certainly lots of things to think about, uh, Dr. Devicki. We're going to have to figure out how to do some of the semi-quantitative stuff on our sub hairlines because I think that would be a really cool way to create our local game. So thank you so much and uh, thanks for everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks for the great discussion, guys.